Uh, all right, so uh, good evening, everyone. We are uh, Dr. Starostina's Material Science and Characterization Lab. Our specific project that we're working on is the evaluation of dihedral angle twin boundaries in copper. And our authors are Fina Yin, Sahiti Srikant, Saket Poturu, Darvis Gao, Brady Stark, Derek Zhang, Ayush Pawar, and me, Rohan Saket. Really. Rohan, let me ask um, Natalia. Natalia, can you hit the slideshow and make it full screen? Um, it's right up by the share. It's okay. If, if it's not working, that's fine. Go ahead. I just wanted to see if that would help. But go ahead. Go ahead, Ron. All right, perfect. So let's move on to the next slide and we can get started. All right. So I think we all have already, already know what uh, copper is. But it turns out that copper is actually a pretty under-researched alloy. So the reason why copper is pretty important is it's anti-corrosive and it's pretty ductile. So it's a good conductor. It can be used in wires. It's extremely important. And of course, it's extremely good at thermal energy transfer. So copper is going to be the main subject of our discussion today. And within copper, we have what we call boundaries. So in any crystallographic structure, we have boundaries that are created between crystals. So there's two ways boundaries are grain boundaries, they're called, are usually created. They're either thermal or deformational. Uh, deformational happens when you apply a stress and some kind of shear transformation onto the material, or you put it under thermal stress, which can also induce crystallization in like unorthodox angles. So I'm going to talk later a little bit about what exactly twin boundaries are. So, but what's really important that we want to consider is exactly what is the effect on the twin boundaries in copper. And the second half of our project is also about the surface roughness and how it is affected as well by our treatment. Like we're going to go into topological analysis, computational modeling, and analysis of surface free energy. So let's move on to the next slide. So here is an example of the structural, um, the structure of copper. We call it FCC, face center. And when we look at when we look at this, we can actually see that when you talk about material science, just like our previous group talked about, material science is the collaboration between structure and the actual material properties. So we're going to be doing. Uh, three different, three or more different types of tests. We're going to look at tensile strength, hardness, and additional properties. And what we want to do actually as a project outcome is utilize tools like the OM, SEM, 3D printing, and FreeCAD to actually study how these are in a macro scale before we move on to a micro scale. And eventually, when we talk about the AFM, we're going to use computational modeling to help us out in all of this. So that's a little background. And now the main thing, main meat of our project is boundaries and microstructure. So I already talked about why they're important. So the specific thing about boundaries is there's intermolecular forces and interatomic forces that play a big role in the structural integrity or conductivity of, or ductility of copper. So twin boundaries are a special type of boundary where the crystals are actually on a mirror plane with each other. If you look at the white, picture, you can see that red line, that is our axis, that is the boundary itself. And both of the angles, which we call a dihedral angle, are kind of, it shows how it's being reflected. And it's a special type of grain boundary that we are going to be studying in our project. And it's really imperative in why or how a structure behaves. And once we have, once we study the dihedral angle and exactly what it is inside copper, we can move on to what we call interfacial free energy. And it's calculated depending on how the twins interact. And the angle that you see right here in the slide is what we call the dihedral angle. And our study essentially wants to compare our own findings with copper and also 
previous findings and also different findings with other alloys. So in the future, we want to use an AFM, which uh, can go even to fractions of microns to study not only the boundaries, but also the surface, surface roughness, which is why it's extremely important that we are able to fundraise for an AFM to be able to computationally find these things. So that's an overview of the background of the project. Um, so now let's move on to our methods, what exactly we did. So the first thing we did was polish our copper samples. We each got two copper samples and these are received from factory, uh, from the factory build. We started by moving the sample back and forth in one direction on the coarsest sandpaper we had. The coarseness of the paper corresponds to grit, which refers to the size of the particles capable of polishing that are embedded in the paper. The lower the grit, the larger the particles are. The first sandpaper we used was 12 micrometers, which is the largest grit size that we used. And we switched to sandpaper with smaller micrometer sizes, ranging from nine micrometers to five micrometers. And we repeatedly uh, repeated the polishing process for three micrometer sandpaper as well, until we started seeing mirror-like areas. After that, when we got to the one micrometer sandpaper, the mirror-like areas continued to get bigger. Finally, with the 0.3 micrometer sandpaper, we could see a reflection that indicated that most of the surface was mirror-like and our sample was prepared for the next step. Is uh, someone presenting? Does someone want to fill in? Who who can fill in? I can fill in. Uh, I don't know what happened to the connection. So uh, our next step is the etching. To visualize brain boundaries, we, can, we have to use the certain uh, um, combination of acids to edge the sample. In our case, we use the diluted nitric acid 50 to 50, one to one ratio. Uh, so uh, this art of sample preparation is um, a little bit tricky, so it takes quite a bit of iterations, maybe a couple of steps forward and one backward. So we uh, uh, tested uh, the etching time on many, many samples. You see the edge student had like two samples, and we tested the edging, uh, not edging time, uh, etching time uh, between one second to 95 seconds. So we covered uh, like a minute and a half time to find uh, that perfect timing for um, um, for, for visualization of brain boundaries. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to stop etching process, we use water, and to prevent oxidation and film formation, we use methanol basically to rinse our samples. In, uh, uh, does can you hear me now? I'm sorry, my microphone wasn't working. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, um. I'll, I'll just present the slides now. So our next procedure was to etch our sample in order to visualize a grain structure. So our lab prepared an etching solution that contained 50% nitric acid and 50% distilled water to dip our copper sample into. And each lab member performed etching by dipping our sample into the solution. And we each did so for a various amount of time, ranging from one to 95 seconds, in order to compare the amounts of grain that was produced when observed later on. And after we removed the sample from the solution and transferred it to a beaker of distilled water and rinsed to prevent any further etching. Our next step was to dip the sample in methanol to minimize the oxidation la layer, as Dr. Staracino was saying. And finally, we let our samples dry. So our third step was to use a Nikon and Olympus optical microscope, and we were able to observe the etched samples. Optical microscopes use a series of lenses to magnify the images of our samples with visible light. We observed our samples at different magnifications, ranging from 50 times magnification to 200 times magnification, and did so for our etched and polished samples, as well as our samples when they were just polished. At these different magnifications, we took a picture of each sample in order to compare the differences. So to start off, 
our research into copper and its twin boundaries, we first had to understand the structure of the copper, which is modeled by the FCC unit cell. In an FCC unit cell, the atoms are structured so that they're located at each corner of the cube and at the center of each face of the cube. They're layered specifically in that arrangement because the structure makes the atoms closely packed together, which maximizes the density of the material, and in our case, the copper we're analyzing. From there, we had to choose between the hard sphere and the reduced sphere model. On the left is the hard sphere model, and on the right is the reduced sphere model. In our opinion, the reduced sphere model is better suited is better suited to study surface roughness because of the, because of the rounded out atoms in the model. That's different from the flat faces of the hard sphere model, which are also easier to cut into different orientations, making it better suited to observe its faces. And for those reasons, we chose the hard sphere model. After choosing the hard sphere model, we then put them into FreeCAD and the Prusa slicer to further understand their structure. Then we slice them into different orientations, such as the 001, 110, and 111 orientation, because FCC unit sounds can be in different orientations within the crystal lattice. Different orientations are important because they give us, they give the metal different properties and researchers can gain insights into the properties of materials through their orientation. But we haven't gone that far into it and we won't go in that direction. Instead, we're gonna use the structure of the crystal lattice to help observe and identify the twin boundaries in the copper samples we have in real life. After printing out all previously mentioned FCC models, we model twin boundaries by physically cutting and supergluing separate blocks together. Twinning is tough to visualize, so constructing a tangible model helps with picturing the orientation. The model displayed is an amalgam of all the planes we worked on as a group. The flat surfaces are the 001 planes, the inclined plane is the 110 plane, and the white triangle is a representation of the 111 plane. This is the twinning plane, where the twinning in copper usually occurs across. This is an attempt to observe grain boundaries. They can vary in structure depending on factors such as grain size and orientation. We have achieved an adequate mirror finish by using sandpaper in order of coarseness, 12 microns to 0.3 microns, but this technique is still in the process of being perfected. The results of the polishing process were then used for etching. These samples were etched as received, meaning that they were not subjected to any heat treatment. After observing all etched copper samples using the Nikon optical microscope and under four different magnifications, our results show no clear grain boundaries. The vendor did not spe specify grain size, but it was already thought that the grain boundaries of the copper samples would be too small for the optical microscopes to observe. Out of all etched copper samples, the sample that was etched for 65 seconds is the most promising because of its grainy and unique appearance under the 200 and 400 X magnification. This 3D model shows the surface roughness of a 620.1 micron by 750 micron portion of a polished copper sample. This was done using Quick 3D, a feature of the newly installed Kios microscope. Quick or Auto 3D creates a fairly accurate computer replica of the sample by taking multiple images of it. It begins with the lowest part of the sample and slowly works up, stitching the photos together to form a comprehensive model. Other features such as measurement, lighting preference, and glare removal have been tested and proved to work well. All right, so to conclude, we are currently in a process of learning how to prepare metallurgical samples for microscopy observations. And we, through that, we are polishing and etching, which is essential. And currently the samples we have received are as received in the factory. So we didn't do any heat treatment, which is why they did not yield the desired results. Uh, so we learned how to use metallurgical and digital optical microscopes and the 3D printer Prusa, which we printed the unit cells you saw in the presentation before. And we also learned how to 3D print SEC unit cells and orientations of 001, 110, and 101. Our plans for the future involve modeling and observing the twin boundaries in copper, which includes doing things like continuing to model twin boundaries with 3D models, polishing using a polishing machine to obtain an even mirror finish, annealing or heat treating copper samples to observe large thermal twins rather than the small, difficult to see twins 
that we see in the sample when we receive it. And using a scanning electron microscope, optical microscop microscopy, and the Keen's microscope to examine the surface and twin boundaries of the annealed and etched copper. Like Rohan said earlier, we need to get a AFM, an atomic force microscope, to further our research. It's essential because we need it to form dihydral angle measurements, and it helps us estimate the ratio of interfacial free energies of twinning energies. It costs fifty thousand dollars, so we really need support to get this. This is uh, essential to our research. It works by uh, the microscope works by using uh to, by feeling the surface of a of a uh, material to map out like the topography your references thank you uh so we're gonna thank ASDRP and faculty also dr Stewart, Stina, and the parents are there any questions?